So how can we actually sort of incentivize our creative, wonderful entrepreneurs and academics and you know, private sector friends to actually create those new technologies that not only have those commercial applications, that not only provide you know, amazing new um, impact to society uh, and the way we live our lives, but also have a dual use for defense um, and for security. Uh, I suppose I suppose I wear a number of hats, really, um, in terms of who I am. Uh, so with regards to Imperial, uh, I am a current PhD student here, uh, and where I am looking at and conducting research into how new technologies might impact national security. Um, I think we can talk a little bit about that uh, later on. Um, I'm also on the uh, advisory um, group for the uh, IWST. Uh, here at Imperial as well. So I wear a couple of hats here um, in the university, which is slightly odd being a student and on the advisory group, but that's that's fine, that's cool. Um, professionally, uh, I've just left NATO after nearly 10 years. They're working on the Secretary General staff in Brussels. And so that is a place where it's kind of like a cross between uh, the Ministry of Defence and the Foreign Office. Um, NATO is quite large and there's different components across the organisation but I was working in where the political part was predominantly. And the last job I had there was as head of innovation uh, for the Alliance. And prior to that, what brought me into NATO was uh, working in the area of intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance. And that was where I specialized when I was a British Army officer, which I was doing uh, for about 12 years or so prior to joining NATO. And as that profession time, uh, tends, to, tends to do, takes you around to all of the um, you know, top 10 holiday destinations uh, that one can imagine. So um, I've been uh, in, in various places uh, around the world as, as an army officer. And now um, I've uh, just, uh, just about to join uh, John Hopkins um, and uh, work on the faculty there in the university uh, in the US. So um, yeah, very exciting. An interesting one because uh, in essence I uh, left left school left high school um, but uh, I didn't finish my A-levels so I left after lower sixth uh, so uh, I suppose I can be characterized as a high school dropout <laughs> and uh, went into the military and that that was that was that was really difficult um, not the decision you know I, I've always had since a very early age since you know since a teenager you know that desire to, to serve and, and to you know work in the, in the public sector, so, uh, so to speak. Um, but going through, leaving home for the first time, going through military training uh, and all the bits and pieces um, at, at a young age, that's, it's, it's really difficult, that's hard. Um, and, and there's no two ways about that. And so, but when you come out the other side, uh, actually um, you learn that you can do things you didn't think were possible uh, and you start to, uh, yeah, you start to, for me at least personally, started to open my mind as to what the possibilities might be. So um, I was in the ranks in, in the Air Force uh, for, for about, I guess, two and a half years. And I was lucky because I was posted to um, Britain's permanent joint headquarters, which is the operational headquarters for the UK. It's, it's based uh, just outside of London um, in, in, in Northwood and is in a, in a you know, deep bunker underground so I didn't see much uh, daylight for a couple of years um, but the great thing about that was it because it was all of the services there so the army uh, the navy and the air force uh, you got to see all of the different cultures that were associated to those services and I realized quite quickly that I had probably joined the wrong service uh, d just because of my own the way I am and, and, and the, the sort of things I wanted to do uh, and, and the culture of the Air Force, and, and so that's not a, not a criticism, just a, just a reality. And I was lucky that um, some officers there, army officers where I worked, saw, saw some potential in me, um, being, being very young, still a teenager, uh, and helped me to guide me through the process to get into Sandhurst uh, and, uh, and then become an officer. Um, and, and I think that was quite profound, that moment of where uh, people in a, in a senior role, so these officers, uh, actually saw the youth, saw the potential and, and helped bring that up. And that 
that trait has been something which is important to me and something which I have tried to the best of my ability to carry on throughout my career, you know, up, up until today, uh, where, you know, having faith in uh, younger people and actually, you know, doing what you can to, to, to bring them into organisations and to, to give them responsibilities and opportunities because that's what people have done for me in my career when I was, when I was younger um, and I feel a responsibility to, to do the same. So all of that's to say that um, there was a, that, that specific moment moving from the Air Force, you know, into the Army, becoming an officer, um, there were some quite foundational moments to that. And then I think that the actual, um, I suppose the responsibility uh, that comes with being a, a commissioned officer in, in, the, uh, in, in, in any of the UK services, quite frankly, um, that also really um, impacted me quite significantly. And, and, and just having, um, yeah, a, a, uh, a desire and, and a need and a want to try to improve things and, and feeling that, you know, you have a, a responsibility to do so. And so um, that can be a great motivator. You know, that can really, you know, generate huge amounts of creativity and, and, and allow you to look at problems from different ways. Um, but it, it also can sometimes weigh you down a little bit uh, and, and that you're, uh, you know, trying to be responsible for everything. And that, and that gets, you know, there's, there's a balance to be struck there. Um, and I think that uh, that's one thing that certainly I learned whilst, um, whilst I was in the army. You know, we take a step back. Uh, the military has always embraced new technologies. Uh, you know, going all the way back to um, artillery and, and, and you know, gunpowder and uh, um, you know the, the, the aircraft and, and jets and submarines. You know, new technology has, has always been a part of uh, militaries trying to get the upper hand. And fundamentally, you know, it's about power uh, and, and trying to be more powerful, such that, um, to put it very bluntly, they can win. And, and people tend not to speak in terms of winning and losing anymore, but um, I, think, I think that's fundamentally a mistake, but that's a slightly different point. So when we think of emerging technologies, the concept of militaries adopting new tech to help them do and operate and function more effectively isn't really a new idea. You know, this has been, been uh, around for a long time. Um, I think what we've, what we've sort of stumbled in uh, upon really in the last... Um, probably, I don't know, probably sort of since the end of the Cold War, uh, is that um, there's been a challenge, uh, and for multiple reasons, as to how militaries and governments are able to adopt these new technologies. So, so specifically, um, that challenge lies in the way in which acquisition is done, procurement, um, in trying to uh, make the best use of public funds and have clear aud auditable trails um, and often a mentality of trying to have uh, what I might call exquisite stuff. So having like perfect solutions to meet very specific needs. And, and that actually creates a culture where um, you end up being driven by process and, and, and people are often driven by the processes rather than perhaps taking a step back and just asking themselves a very simple question. Okay, well, what are we actually trying to do here? What, where, what, what might be the art of the possible? So when we bring this into the, into the realm of emerging and disruptive technologies, um, at NATO, you know, we were really um, looking at an initial batch of, of, of a handful that included artificial intelligence, data analytics, um, uh, biotechnologies, quantum computing, uh, um, uh, space, uh, and uh, you know, autonomy, um, and so, uh, and then robotics, if you will. And so the idea was, okay, these technologies exist, um, they're becoming, uh, or, or, or are close to existence, you know, they're kind of on a, a different scale. I think quantum would probably, you know, isn't quite uh, prime time ready at this stage. But the others exist in some way, shape, or form, and we see this um, in much of our lives. So, for example, we take artificial intelligence. You know, when we log on to Amazon or Netflix, you know, there's algorithms running in the background to try and help us decide what might be appropriate um, that we may wish to buy or to watch. Um, when we look at uh, drones now, we start to see when we watch you know, football matches, you know, there are drones providing cameras and imagery to, to support you know, our viewing experience. Um, when we uh, look at the... Um, 
growth really in, in space. You know, we start to see shoebox satellites that now provide you know, both uh, internet connection opportunities for people around the world much more affordably and equally you know, uh, the ability to provide and, and purchase uh, imaging through um, you know, very simple uh, websites. So the point being is that our society, people, us, we are getting used to these technologies. They're becoming part of our day-to-day -day lives. And so the assumption is that the military are embracing all of these and, and are part and parcel of you know, the military setup as well, such that they can support what the military is trying to do. Um, the reality is very different. And so um, fundamentally, you know, a lot of these technologies are very, very, very slowly creeping in, um, but being in, conducted in such a way that uh, I think there's probably a, a sort of cultural deficit between what our public are expecting of our militaries and assuming is available relative and versus the reality. So what we did at NATO, what we were doing at NATO, was to try to create the opportunities whereby, all right, um, how can we help allies uh, adopt a lot of these technologies? What, is, what are the real barriers to entry? How can we actually kind of reimagine uh, working with the private sector to be able to take, you know, various algorithms, sensors, you know, understand some of the data, for example, on you know, legacy jets and try to make their engines more uh, perform to a higher level um, and, and apply these um, various uh, technologies in, um, in different contexts. Now, what makes them disruptive is the fact that uh, because society... Uh, and people are using these technologies in their day-to-day -day lives, or, or most of them at least. What makes them disruptive is the fact that the private sector is conducting the bulk of the investment in them. And so what we've seen is when you go back and look at the, the, the fiscal data for this, you've seen really since 1957, when the Sputnik moment took place, you saw a huge spike in, uh, particularly in the United States, uh, government, uh, public sector uh, investment in research and development for new tech, new stuff. And so as a result of that uh, investment and activity and innovation and creativity during the 20th century, we have now ended up with things like GPS, with the internet, with touchscreen, uh, and so on and so forth. All of these came from government investment uh, to try to meet the needs of the military during the Cold War. The commercial application was a, was a, was a byproduct, a spin-off. It wasn't intended. That's totally reversed now. Because in 1957, government expenditure was up here, private sector uh, expenditure on research and development was down here. Today, 2022, they've totally flipped. So these technologies are becoming disruptive because the private sector is A, plowing far, far, far more money into their development and new technologies as well, and, prov and creating them such that they can be commercialized and used by everyday people. And so it is the speed at which all of this is happening in creating these new technologies that is allowing for that disruption to come about. Um, and disruption in so much as how um, people can, can operate and function and use. And you just look, need to look at Ukraine as an example, whereby um, it was a tweet uh, from the uh, one of the ministers in the Ukrainian government to Elon Musk, basically asking for Starlink to provide internet coverage. And suddenly, you know, within hours you had a resilient internet connection over Ukraine, um, all brought about by uh, a social media platform, Twitter, uh, a private company, um, SpaceX, uh, and a private uh, actor, you know, positioning um, commercial disruptive technologies. You know, that's one tiny example as well, as well documented, of course. But um, the point being is that this is the speed at which uh, these technologies um, and their application can move upon. And think about the, uh, the ability and the resilience, the resilience that this has allowed Ukraine to have by having, you know, a, a pretty reasonably decent internet, um, internet coverage. So, so the point being is, going back to what I said earlier, the, the processes and the way in which governments tend to think about purchasing and adopting new technologies is really sort of geared and built for a, for a, a bygone era. Um, the investment and the development is really now being driven by the private sector. 
Uh, and so the tempo that they work at means that whoever's able to adopt these technologies the quickest will um, probably have a, a military uh, advantage, both strategically and tactically. And so the point being, it's not really um, those countries and governments that have the best technology that are going to kind of win uh, this, this technology race. Um, it's those that uh, are able to uh, be uh, the most agile uh, that are going to win it. I think industrial policy is a is a, is a it can be a, a trigger a trigger phrase for some people, um, because there's kind of uh, thoughts that oh my goodness you've got civil servants sat in Whitehall or in DC or in Brussels um, who have no commercial experience who have no skin in the game if I can put it like that uh, trying to um, pick companies to invest public money in and who will also be being heavily lobbied which is just a reality. Uh, to, to do so as well. This can only this this, this is kind of completely uh, against you know the free market. You know that's not how markets work and function. This is this is uh, this is not how Adam Smith imagined things. Um, so that's you know that's, so that you, you end up in a world where we can we can never possibly do this. It's just not you know uh, it's, it's inefficient. It's not effective. Um, these sorts of words get used. The other end being. Oh no no! We, we government should absolutely you know determine uh, where money should be put into which companies and so on and so forth, and we should be doing this. You know, we it's it's a middle ground, and and so I think um, you know we need to have a little bit more of a of a reality check here as to what is it we're trying to achieve, um, and the reason that you know governments can and should invest in new and emerging disruptive technologies isn't necessarily about picking winners. It's not about that in my mind. What it is about is using capital, so money, appropriately. So what do I mean by that? I mean that in, finan in the financial world, uh, if you were to speak to a financial analyst, they would be able to model for you uh, the financial risk and put a quantitative value on that for whatever the investment might be that you're, you're looking at. And they can, they can you know, allocate that based on a whole raft of... Uh, Evaluations and inputs and so forth, and so you can do that. Um, and so, of course, when um, investors, so you know, venture capitalists, but also uh, sort of perhaps you know, research and development components of large companies and so forth, when they're looking at perhaps developing new technologies, um, they will be doing so on a risk-adjusted basis. So they'll be looking at what that risk is, and their incentive, because they're commercial entities is at the moment in the way in which we think about capitalism is to maximize shareholder value maximize profits for shareholders right that's that's the that's the model uh this country the uk works under when we think about capitalism and and the united states so of course that's the incentives that investors have when they're thinking about emerging technologies um and putting private money to use to try to um you know maximize their return when we think about government money public sector money um, there's a different role there for that money because actually I would argue that we don't want government money, public sector money, when it comes to emerging technologies to take risk. We want to take zero risk. We want to go beyond risk. We want to go into the world of uncertainty. Right? The world where actually governments can afford to make big bets on technologies that could have groundbreaking opportunities and transitions and change. For, 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 for everyone, for, for society writ large, as well as for the military um, and for national security needs. And so understanding the difference and the, and the different uh, roles and responsibilities of these different types of money is something which I don't think most governments get. They don't realise that governments don't go out of business. Well, they tend not to. Um, <laughs> there might be one or two... Uh, one or two uh, you know, outliers there, um, but they don't go out of business, so they can afford to make, that's, to make these bets. And that's not the same as like, oh, we need to waste public money on you know random, uh, you know, sort of uh, ideas that are just utterly. I mean, that's 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 not that argument. What I'm saying is that if we accept the idea that private capital is driving new and emerging technology development, because there's been a shift from 1957 to today, from public sector money in R&D to private sector money, if we accept that then we also need to understand 
the incentive structures. And for private money, the incentive structures is not to make a public good that provides security for our country. It's, it's, it's about maximizing shareholder value because that's a model of capitalism we live in. Whether that's right or wrong or whether that model is coming to an end, that's a different question and maybe we'll come back to that. But so therefore, understanding that the money from the public sector that does still get invested in R&D, noting that it's a lot smaller than the private sector, right? you, you can't be sort of tinkering around the edges with that money. You can't just be sort of uh, looking to try to, you know, basically replicate what the private sector are doing or indeed you know, sort of co-invest. You need to be going beyond that. You need to be stepping away from these risk-adjusted returns and diving into the pool of uncertainty. And that is very, very, very difficult culturally culturally for most civil servants for most governments um, because there is quite frankly what you're doing there is you're not taking financial risk you're taking political risk both with a small p and a capital p depending on what you're doing because if these projects don't work out then there'll be a backlash all right um, from, from the public because it's public sector money uh, and so that is the fear there's a culture of fear that actually trying something and it not working um, ends up prohibiting any effort or any meaningful effort I should say in this area so so that is kind of the long-winded way of identifying the problem and the conundrum I think those countries that understand this issue and are attacking it um, properly and, and in, a, in, a, in, a, in a clear manner um, you know disappointingly there's not as many as there should be um, and, and it's a cultural problem it's not the fact there isn't enough resources there are uh, it's not the fact there isn't the sort of the will and the design, the creativity within governments to think about, you know, what the art of the possible could be, what the future might look like. Right? There is. It's a cultural issue where um, both politicians and civil servants are simply unwilling or unable uh, to um, step into those risk type opportunities. I think an outlier here is Estonia. I think Estonia does this very well. Um, I think probably because their incentives are a little different. You know, they're on the border with Russia, you know, their population is like 1.6 million, so, so they're, they're small enough to be able to you know, be a little agile. Um, but culturally, they embrace this sort of new technology and also using partnering with public sector um, and private sector on, on different pieces as well. And, and again, this isn't all about either or. Um, there's opportunities for partnerships in meaningful ways between, you know, creative entrepreneurs and public sector communities and so forth, you know, represent um, opportunities that could exist. So we saw this in NATO as a big problem. And so one of the things which, which I did with my team was to lead the creation of basically NATO's DARPA, you know, what we call DIANA, the Defence Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic. Yeah, so I think I think with DARPA, I think um, you know it's a great book. I forget the author now, but uh, the Imagineers of War is, is the book, and that really provides a, a comprehensive history of DARPA. And the thing that struck me when I was reading that um, that book a few months ago was uh, just how um, there have been, in terms of like the organisational structure and the internal politics of creating, in this case, you know, DARPA, uh, and um, where it kind of sat within the Department of Defense and, and who the boss of DARPA reported to, all, all of these kind of um, internal politics, there was a lot of noise at the beginning of DARPA's life. It was not uh, an easy birth, if I can put it like that. And so um, this is the sort of thing which I see and have seen in the last 10 years of working in um, you know, international politics in, in, in Brussels and in, in NATO is that a lot of people get focused on these sorts of issues as to where are these organisations, you know, who's in control, who's in charge, where do they sit? Um, and, and actually, I kind of miss the point about uh, what are we actually trying to achieve here? You know, often, you know, these sorts of organisational chats, you know, end in, in code words like, you know, what's the government structure, all right? and, and which, is, which is code for, all right, I want to be in charge. So, and that was what was happening with DARPA in the early years. And this went on for a number of years with DARPA, you know, right in, in, you know, um, in, in, in the 60s and so forth. Um, and it's a fascinating read to understand. It, it's, it's actually quite amazing that the organisation survived as it did. Um, 
and was able to produce uh, or, or facilitate, I should say, facilitate the production of some of these technologies. And I think one way it did that was because of this decentralized approach that, DARPA, that it had, that DARPA had, whereby you had a relative, relatively small team, program managers, um, deciding what the sort of problem sets might be that uh, are worth taking a look at. And then DARPA would go off and work with universities and research institutions and what have you and fund you know, the, the sort of uh, basic research to actually try to get at these ideas and issues. And because of that decentralized structure um, and the huge amount of trust and faith and empowerment that these program managers had, uh, which, which, was, which was great, they were able, you know, to actually help facilitate the breakthrough of some of these amazing technologies, and the internet being one of them. I think, I think what's happened over time is what tends to happen in, in pretty much all organizations um, and, and, and bureaucracies, is, 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 is there's been more administration, there's been more centralization, and whilst the core tenets of DARPA hasn't fundamentally changed, you know, there's, there's, more, there's more layers of bureaucracy above, in, in, in my opinion at least. And so, um, you know, what, what does that mean? It means that, um, that it's, it's perhaps a little more difficult um, uh, to, to conduct things relative to how they were in the Cold War time. I think also as well, you know, you've got to remember the context has changed during the Cold War. There was a clear, you know, we lived in a bipolar world. There's a very clear mission, if I can call it like that. Um, that has kind of adapted and evolved since then. So, so it's, an, it's inevitable that the organisation perhaps, you know, wanes a little bit in that respect. Um, I think, though, the other thing with DARPA, which is, um, again, just a reality, I mean, the D in DARPA stands for defence. And so the work that they do is really in support of the defence community um, in the United States. But as we've already talked about, new and emerging disruptive technologies uh, come about predominantly from the private sector, and they're not necessarily for defence use exclusively. In fact, well, in fact, they're not. I mean, so... So as a result, you know, you start to see new technology being derived from the private sector. Why? Because there's more money there. They're focused on commercial activity, um, and but their use cases and applications can, of course, be applied to the world of national security. I think that's what um, was a challenge uh, with DARPA, that it was defence-focused uh, and not commercially-focused. So I think what we're looking at NATO was we're trying to get into what we're calling dual use. So... How can we actually sort of incentivize our creative, wonderful entrepreneurs and academics and you know, private sector friends to actually create those new technologies that not only have those commercial applications, that can not only provide you know, amazing new um, impact to society uh, and the way we live our lives, but also have a dual use for defense um, and for security. And so if we can start to uh, unpack what those technologies are and look to ha see how we might invest in them, but equally making sure, making sure, and this is the key point, making sure that um, we're really clear on the problems we're trying to solve, all right? and, ma and making sure that it's really understood what, what are the problems that we're trying to address here, and what might the future look like with regards to, you know, let's say we imagine a world whereby technology X is in is in place you know what could that what could that mean and so these are the sorts of you know foundational fundamental questions and points that you know we would want to see in in NATO Diana in terms of framing problems um, making sure that we work alongside the military folks to do what we call co-development um, but incentivizing the private sector uh, to, to look at the yeah, this dual use applicability of these new technologies, be it um, for, for, for private use or indeed for government. And I think what NATO does that's quite interesting is, is it has the NATO brand, it has the name. And whilst, you know, I think it's around about 85% of the world's venture capital money resides in the United States, um, and quite frankly, most of it is spent in the United States. You know, there are uh, another well, now another 31 countries in NATO, in Europe, um, well, and Canada, of course, uh, who have amazing engineers, technologists, creativity, but basically for a multiple, uh, multitude of reasons, that venture capital money is simply not finding them in, in Europe. So with NATO, when you have not only the Diana component, 
of looking at trying to frame problems and actually create an environment where those problems can be addressed in places like Imperial, you know, Imperial College London will be the home of uh, Diana for, for Europe. Um, you also want a money, a fund uh, to sit alongside that to help crowd in the investment into areas perhaps that otherwise would not receive a lot of this private sector venture capital money. So that was the idea of creating this NATO fund that sits alongside Diana and it's the NATO name and brand and the power that that has in particularly in Europe um, that will shine a spotlight on whatever you know new uncertain untested technology might be, there might be and actually providing the confidence to you know the market uh, to other investors to, to come along and be part of that uh, investment activity and, and trying to um, you know, bring, bring them along if you will. So going back to the point about industrial policy, this isn't necessarily about picking winners per se and, and being sort of individual governments focusing on, on, on where we wish to invest. It's about framing problems, seeing where there could be huge opportunities and then actually providing an opportunity to to crowd in the private sector to help with that investment. And clearly, if the private sector don't want to invest, then that tells us something that actually, all right, maybe the commercial application of this isn't, isn't what we thought it was. And that's important because, as I've said before, if you don't get the commercial application there, then that's where all of the investment and follow-on development comes from. Then actually, in the government, we're not going to benefit from those um, spin-offs and upgrades and so on and so forth that are derived through... Um, the commercial side of it. So, so if there is no commercial component to this dual use model, then actually it, it, it kind of falls down. And, and so that's fine. You know, we walk away, we look at something else. Right? And that's, that's what we're trying to do. So, I mean, let's go back to, to Macron's, um, President Macron's statement. So, that was an interview with The Economist in, in uh, November 2019. And we've got to remember as well, there was a NATO summit in December 2019 in London, um, in the UK. And so uh, one, and this is in, in, in the back, against the backdrop, of course, of Brexit. So first of all, all right, there are some politics going on there. All right, because um, uh, in essence, you've got, you know, London and uh, Boris Johnson as the Prime Minister then, being on the world stage, hosting uh, NATO world leaders and so on and so forth. Um, but of course, what was everybody talking about at that time? Well, they're talking about Emmanuel Macron. All right, so, so let's just be clear, there was some politics going on there. And that's, you know, that's, you know, some rough and tumble of politics, it is what it is. So there was, there was a component, the timing, timing is everything in politics, and so it, it wasn't, uh, that wasn't a mistake that that was done when it was done. That's point one. But point two, he was kind of right, you know, President Macron. I mean, it was perhaps, you know, when, uh, <coughs> when one, you know, writes a, a smart message uh, on a piece of paper and wraps it around a brick and throws it through a window, people only generally look at the smashed window. And they don't really look at the message. But what he was really saying was that, you know, where is this alliance going? What is the strategic direction? Um, and we need to rethink this. And so I think given, given what has happened over the last three years, you know, there is a real need to have some self, honest self-reflection across the alliance. Because when you look at the last 12 months alone, NATO has been politically and militarily beaten in Afghanistan. Right? Again, lost, basically. Um, we have war in Europe. Now, of course, people will say, well, Ukraine's not in NATO. And that's kind of irrelevant. Ukraine is the battleground, but the war is against NATO. Right? We need to be clear about that. So, so we've kind of got a failing as to NATO's core raison d'etre. And it looks like there could be, you know, unstitching of, of the NATO work that's going on in the Balkans. The Balkans is becoming incredibly um, destabilizing. So there are three massive things that have occurred or occurring in the last 12 months. And there isn't really any intra-reflection on this. There isn't really any acknowledgement and, and think, thinking, all right, there are patterns here uh, which, which are going on, um, and we probably need to rethink how we do business. And so I think Macron was, was right to raise that point. 
the way he did it was, like I say, slightly tricky, but nonetheless. And the first step, fundamentally, for the Alliance is, is to, is to recognise that um, there have been some significant mistakes at a grand strategic level. I mean, these are, these, are, these are big problems. The fact that, you know, the largest conflict NATO's been involved in, total political and military failure and loss, right, fact. War in Europe, fact. And, you know, who knows what's happening with regards to the Balkans. And I think until we start to have a little bit of honesty with regards to these issues and start to get to the root cause as to why this might be the case, it's, it's really difficult for, for the organisation's credibility to continue. So that said, where I do think there is, you know, that's very negative, of course, where I want to be more positive, where I do see as you know, huge opportunities, um, you know, NATO as an organisation, as a platform and as an idea is absolutely essential to the security of Europe and to North America. What I think we're stepping into, though, is a world where we simply need far greater levels of resilience, um, far greater uh, levels of almost decentralization, if you will. So, so these concepts feel a little abstract, but what do I mean? I mean, for, for NATO, fundamentally, there's was, there was still too much reliance on the United States. And so, therefore, when you have any organization where one component is kind of the key component, then actually that might seem a great strength, but equally it's a great vulnerability. And so we need to have you know, a much stronger European um, element to, to NATO than is currently the case. I think when we talk about, you know, often you hear of NATO, this metric of 2%, 2% of GDP, 2% of gross domestic product, that is what is the minimum, the benchmark, where investment should be made. But when you look at the economic challenges and, and, and challenges and understatement that this continent, that Europe in particular, is facing. Well, you know, I'll take it to an extreme, but 2% of nothing is nothing. So when we start to go into recessions, which, you know, countries are already in, in NATO, and uh, when we look at the economic output and outcomes that are going to happen perhaps 12 months from now, uh, then actually looking at defence expenditure relative to um, gross domestic products is is actually not a very smart way to think about um, military strength. And so, you know, we really need to be sort of re-asking ourselves um, how, how do we want to uh, utilise perhaps new technologies and uh, real um, hardware, uh, and, and I suppose software, um, that can make a difference. What are the problems we're trying to solve? What, what does success look like for NATO? I mean, a very simple question what does success for NATO look like with regards to Ukraine? You know, this is strategy 101 stuff. Is it Russia has left Ukraine and all borders, including Crimea, uh, so prior to 2014, uh, are the integrity of those, those Ukrainian borders are put back to where they were? Is that success? Is success actually, well, maybe, you know, the, the, the land that's been uh, taken by the Russians you know, unlawfully, uh, that's just kind of written off and it is what it is and it's a stalemate. Is that success? The, the point being, is that if you can't determine what a successful criteria is, then any sort of strategy to get there, any sort of plan, is just totally off the mark from day one. It's totally incoherent. It's not going to happen. So the point being is that, as I said at the beginning, NATO's had some really serious failures in the last 12 months, um, and, and, they're, and they're undeniable. And, and Macron kind of, you know, although he didn't say it, uh, he, clearly he doesn't have a crystal ball, this was kind of what he was getting at when he made his remarks in 2019. But because there's not been any genuine acknowledgement, recognition, um, and inward looking of these failures, uh, then it's impossible to think strategically in, in a more sort of coherent manner for the future. And the, the Ukraine example is, is just one. So I would say that the, and I would argue that the strategic concept that came out at the Madrid NATO summit uh, a couple of months ago, in June this year, doesn't really answer these questions. Doesn't really get at the, at the root cause of this. Um, and, and so until we kind of recognize and, and, and show a little bit of uh, strategic humility um, with regards to the last 12 months, and then start to ask difficult questions as to how we go forward, um, it, it's gonna be, I think, tricky uh, to move coherently. And, and it is always tricky when you have a uh, an organization like NATO that has 32 countries and whereby those countries or, or regional um, components of them have different uh, priorities. 
you know, the United States' priority uh, geopolitically is China. Um, that is different to the Baltic states of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Understandably so, because they are on the doorstep of Russia. That is different to the southern European states, who are also worried about um, terrorism in North Africa and you know, migration flows from there. And that's also different uh, in terms of priorities from, from countries like Turkey that have you know, concerns about areas in the Middle East. So it's inevitable, it's always going to be difficult to try to have uh, a coherent idea as to where the alliance is going. That's, that's, and that's not a criticism, that's just a fact of life. It's always been like that. What NATO is very good at is finding that middle ground and that compromise and looking for where you know, the art of the possible exists. But like I say, unless we can actually have some real internal reflections on some of the huge grand strategic failures of the last 12 months, then it's going to be difficult to make sure that where that middle ground is, um, is in fact the correct middle ground for where you wish to be going. And so that is where I think you know, we, need to be, we need to be thinking. And this is where, you know, going back to Macron's point, um, he's, he was probably you know, fairly accurate.